Good morning. Well, I'm awake, which is good. Um, I've been awake since about five, changing diapers. Um, Violet and Lauren are doing well. Uh, we're trying to get her on a bit of a schedule right now. She's on a third shift schedule. Um, she wakes up in the usually around nine o'clock at night and stays up till about two. Um, so we're adjusting to that as best we can. Uh, prayers are appreciated, but we are doing well. She is a precious bundle of joy. And she'll be joining us here hopefully uh, next couple of weeks. We'll, we'll bring her in. So uh, if you're more than welcome to come over to our house at 2 a.m., we'd love to have you. <laughs> bring, bring coffee, cocoa, uh, whatever your vice. Um, a lot of activities I want to touch on. A lot of things are always happening within the church. Uh, so we, we want to draw attention to a couple things if you have your, uh, your uh, little leaflet inside the bulletin. Uh, the Wednesday night Bible study uh, on March 14th uh, with our family meal. We we'll also have a safety team meeting on Tuesday, March the 13th from 6 to 8, uh, and a senior adult luncheon coming up on March 15th at 11 a.m. Also at the end of this week, um, the CBF uh, annual gathering, which will be in Winston-Salem at Knollwood Baptist Church. Um, I will be there presenting on, uh, on an issue of how do we accommodate people in our communities with disabilities, and how we do that within a within a faith community and in that kind of context. So if you want to come out, hang out with me, you're probably going to get to see the kid. Uh, I think she's going to be there too. So if you want to come out and support that and have a really good time uh, at Noah Baptist Church in the next, uh, the end of this week, I'd appreciate you seeing there. All right, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us worship God, for whom our souls thirst and our bodies long. Listen, listen to me, and your soul will delight in the riches of there. We have come to hear the word of God has sent. God's word will not return empty, but will accomplish through us his holy purpose. Let us worship God in spirit and truth.
Join me as we pray. Our God, we come before you here as we journey through the season of Lent on the way to that fateful day when you chose to do for us in and through Jesus Christ that which we could not possibly do for ourselves. We come praying along with the psalmist. God help us, poor men and women. We come as penitents. We come recognizing and acknowledging the truth about ourselves. But at the same time, we come fully aware of your grace that has been made known to us. That it is possible for our brokenness to be mended. Possible for our loneliness to be overcome. Possible for our willfulness to become submission to your will. Possible for our choices that often have injured us and injured others, <clears throat> that have caused wounds that sometimes seem to be beyond healing, to in fact be healed, to be restored, to be made ultimately whole. And so this morning as we begin our time of worship together, <clears throat> in confession we pray for your forgiveness and for your reassurance that you are with us in the midst of every circumstance of our lives. And that makes it possible for us to pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. We welcome you to First Baptist Church this morning. Always glad to have those who are guests with us, and I hope you feel the warmth of this fellowship. Let's turn now and greet one another in the name of Christ.
please hear the call to confession and then join in the prayer. During his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the anger of God against the sin of the whole human race. In response to his sacrifice, let us confess our sins to God. O Christ, out of your fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. You are our eternal hope. You are patient and full of mercy. You are generous to all who call upon you. O Christ, fountain of life and holiness, you have taken away our sins. On the cross, you were wounded for our transgressions and were bruised for our iniquities. O Christ, obedient unto death, source of all comfort, our life and our resurrection, our peace and reconciliation, save us, Lord. O Christ, Savior of all who trust you, hope of all who die for you, and joy of all the saints. Jesus, Lamb of God, bearer of our sins, redeemer of the world, hear our prayer and grant us peace. Amen.
please hear this assurance of forgiveness. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. In Christ we are forgiven. I was gracious, Heavenly Father, we gathered in this gorgeous place that our ancestors and our friends have so wonderfully sacrificed for us, and not for just us, but for your glory. We thank you for them, and we thank you for the, what they've done. We know, Lord, that we're charged with moving your, your message out and about, and we can only do that if we do as you ask us to do, and that's to share in our blessings with our tithes and offerings and we pray that you will help us to do that today and we pray that you'll bless these offerings to our um, exponentially so that they can just touch every part of the world in jesus name we pray amen
Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. This morning's first scripture reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So how much lead do you like in your drinking water? That's a question that's asked on a commercial. I think it's pure water filters, and they set up what they call a water bar, and they've got these spouts from different parts around America, and it's got water from different regions. And a guy steps up, and he says, well, try this water from Colorado. It's well within the acceptable levels of lead. And the fellow says, well, who wants lead in their drinking water? Well, of course, that's a commercial for a water filter. But what if we ask the question this way? Just how much sin do you want in your life? How much do you want to disobey God? You see, whatever we do, whatever we take in affects our lives. I remember when I was a kid going to the lunchroom one time, and I looked up, and the lunch ladies had done a bulletin board, and it said, you are what you eat. And it had this apple with a smile on its face, and it had arms and it had legs. And, you know, you need to be careful with children because they're concrete thinkers. And I didn't want to eat an apple after that. I was scared I was going to turn into this thing. (laughs) But I got it as I grew up, that whatever we take in, whatever we use to nourish our body, that is what we become. What we allow into our lives will either purify us or contaminate us. You see, purity means undiluted or untainted. Do you remember Jesus' first miracle? He turned water into wine. Now, we who are Baptists don't really appreciate that too much. I once heard a Baptist pastor literally say, well, what he did was he made pure grape juice, and it was so good that they didn't recognize it. (laughs) Well, I don't think that's quite right. You know the story how... They brought out the water jars, and Jesus turned them to wine. They took it to the wine steward, and and he said, this is pure. This is delicious. Why are you saving this to last? You usually bring down the watered-down stuff later on when people won't recognize it so much. But whatever Jesus produces, he produces it purely. And Jesus came to show us and to give to us God's pure love. When we talk about purity, oftentimes we think about those things that shouldn't be in our lives, and there are definitely those things we should guard against. But we should also wonder, what is it that we are taking into our life which is pure, which is wholesome? And God's love is so pure and so clean that we can hardly stand it. That's why we water it down. We can't really believe that God loves us that much. But Paul writes to Timothy and says this, The goal of this command is love, which comes from your pure heart and a good conscience of sincere faith. God wants to give us that pure love. But we taint that love. We add impurities to it. We tend to water down the mixture. And God is always telling us to be careful what we allow in our lives. Throughout all of history, God has been fighting this impurity, this idolatrous way that we tend to have. God is always trying to get us to get rid of those things which are not of God and simply to have God's pureness in our lives. God will not accept idolatry. Jesus said it this way, No person can serve two 
masters. You can't have two things in your life to which you give your focus. You need to totally focus your life upon God and to center in God's will. Because purity demands focus of purpose. This past Wednesday night in the group I was leading, we did something called centering prayer. Centering prayer is where you allow yourself to try to simply be in God's presence. It has one goal, and that is to be in the presence of God. It was difficult. We sat in silence for about 10 minutes, and afterwards we talked a little bit about how hard it was just to keep that focus upon God. I told them that some folks call it monkey brain. You know how monkeys jump from one branch to another and here and there and yonder? Anytime we get quiet and we get still, all of this comes into our hearts, into our minds. We're kind of like little Billy in the family circus cartoons. Have you ever seen those little circular cartoons? They're so cute. I saw one, one time where Billy's mother asked him to go and to get some milk from the grocery store. And off Billy goes, and he goes and he sees some construction. And like a little boy, he is drawn to that construction. And he watches that for a while. And then he cuts through the woods, and he sees some squirrels. And he watches them playing in the trees. And then he comes out of the woods, and he sees some of his friends playing tag. So he has to stop to play tag. And pretty soon he goes back home, and his mother says... Where's the milk? He didn't keep his focus. You know, that would be funny, except that's my life. Last week, Valerie sent me to Publix to get some eggs. I walked in, and, and I saw the bananas. I thought, you know, we, we need some bananas, so I got some bananas in the cart. And I looked over, and, and there were some really nice ripe strawberries, so I got some strawberries. And I went around the corner, and I thought, well, uh, we need some milk. That must be what it is. I know it's something cold. And so I went and got some milk and put it in the cart. And I, I actually saw a couple of folks from church and talked to them a little bit. And went home and got ready to make our dinner, which was going to be breakfast. And guess what we didn't have? No eggs. Because that's the way we are. We are so scattered. We have a hard time focusing and being pure. Rick Warren, when he wrote his book, The Purpose Driven Life, gave us five purposes for our lives that he got from Scripture. He said that we are planned for God's pleasure, that our first purpose is simply to worship God, to acknowledge God's presence. He said our second purpose is to be formed for God's family, that fellowship, being together in God's church, and being a part of each other's lives is part of our purpose. He then said that our third purpose was to be created to become more like Christ, which we call discipleship in church. Our purpose is to seek how we might become like Christ. Then he said our fourth purpose was to be shaped for serving God. That is ministry to do for others those things that Christ did for others. And then he said our purpose is also that we are made for mission. That that is evangelism, sharing the testimony, sharing what God has done for us in our lives. Those are pretty simple. He's boiled it down to what it is that we are to be about. And yet we do not focus on these things very well. Stephen Covey says it this way. He says, keep the main thing the main thing. Keep God first and foremost. But these other things come into our lives, and impurity deters us from doing God's work. Listen to what we hear in Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. We read, To be pure, all things, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciousness are corrupted. They claim to know God. But by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything. If we do not allow ourselves to be pure, God cannot use us for God's purposes. You see, we have so much that detracts us, keeps us moving in different directions. I, I know some parents who have a young man, and he likes to get into some different things. When he was younger, he decided he would play tennis, and so they bought him 
the most expensive, nice tennis racket and bought him some tennis outfits and the best tennis shoes. And he played tennis for two or three months and got tired of that. And after that, he decided he would play golf. And so they gave him a membership to a club and they bought him some golf clubs and they gave him some money to go out and to rent the cart. And he played golf for several months. And then that wasn't really what he wanted to do. And then he came in, he said, you know, I would like to play the saxophone. I heard somebody playing and it sounded really cool. They finally wised up and they said this, sure you can play the saxophone. As soon as you save up enough money to buy one, we'll buy you the lessons. They finally figured it out that he was just scattered and you know, that's okay for adolescence. When we are growing up, we try on different hats, we try different things to see what it is that we are to be about and what we are to do. But when we become mature, we need to get serious about God's work. Do we know what God is up to in our lives? And once we find that, we need to take all the distractions and place them aside. You say, well, pastor, that's hard to do, and it is hard to do. Why did God give us the law? Well, yes, to teach us right from wrong, but also because God wanted to have a people who were pure, so that they might have a pure witness. And there's an old story about Gandhi. I'm not sure that it's true or not, but it sounds like something he might would have done. The story goes that a mother brought her son to Gandhi and said, he has a problem with chocolate. He just eats chocolate all of the time. And Gandhi says, well, can you come back in a month? And she said, why, yes. And so they went away, and they came back in a month. And Gandhi set the young man down, and she, he talked to him, and he talked to him about all of the things that chocolate is not good for you. And the boy decided he would give up chocolate. The mother said, this is great, but I have one question. Why couldn't you have done that last month? And he said, well, I had to give up chocolate. <laughs> you see... It's hard for us to be a witness for Christ unless we're willing to lay aside the things that we might call others to lay aside. Purity is what enables us to do God's work. Again, in the book of Titus, we hear, We wait for the blessed hope, the peering of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Jesus came to purify a people, Christ's people, you and me, that we might do good. I loved my JV football coach. His name was Ernest Davis. We didn't call him Coach Davis because the head football coach was Coach Davis. We called him Big E for Ernest, but also because he was about six foot four and about 280 pounds, he was Big E. Big E would always talk to us before the games. He would talk to us about our focus. He'd say, boys, we're about to play a football game and you got to get your head in this game. And he knew all the things we were thinking. He'd say, you can't be thinking about your girlfriend for the next hour. He said, you can't be thinking about your car. You can't be thinking about what you're going to eat after. You can't be thinking about all of that stuff. you got to think about what we're going to do. We've practiced and practiced so that we might perform today. And you got to get your mind on what it is we're about to accomplish. I sometimes wish Big E was around to give me that speech every morning in my life. What about you? When you wake up, you ask God, what is it that you would have me to do today? Not a football speech, but a life speech. What is it that God has brought us here to do? Our purpose is in life to praise and to worship God, to be God's people. And you say, Pastor, that's really hard, and it is. Because we are not capable of it on our own. For only God can bring purity. You know King David, who was a man after God's own heart. 
he became impure. He sinned greatly. And in Psalm 51, he pours his heart out to God, and he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant to me a willing spirit and sustain it. And then I can teach sinners your way. Only when we confess that we are impure, that we are broken, that we are sinful, can God truly cleanse us. Ron Rolsheiser, in his article, The Agony of the Garden, The Place of Transformation, talks about Jesus as a purifying agent, as a cleansing filter. He says this. He says, Jesus takes in hatred, and he holds it, and he transforms it, and he gives back love. He takes in bitterness, and he holds it, and he transforms it, and he gives back graciousness. He takes in curses and he holds them and he transforms them and he gives back blessings. He takes in chaos and holds it and transforms it and gives back order. He takes in fear and he holds it and he transforms it and he gives back freedom. He takes in jealousy and he holds it and he transforms it and he gives back affirmation. He takes in murder and he holds it and he gives back only God's pure forgiveness. He goes on to say, Jesus takes away the sins of the world in the same way a water filter takes impurities out of water by absorbing and holding all that isn't clean and giving back only what is. If we truly want purity in our life, we must give our lives to Christ. We must allow Christ to cleanse us And we must stay in the presence of Christ, or purity can only be maintained by God's presence. Jesus gives us an illustration that. He says, you are already clean of the world because I have spoken that to you. But then he adds, remain in me as I remain in you. For no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. What is purity? It's allowing ourselves to remain rooted in Christ, that Christ's love and grace might flow in us and through us into the world. There's a need to see something pure and clean. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Allred were the first men to walk on the moon on Apollo 11. Michael Collins was the third member, and he was out in the command module before they returned to Earth, simply circling the moon while Armstrong and Allred landed. After they landed, Allred asked for a bit of radio silence, and Houston granted that silence. Not everybody knows what was happening at that time, but Allred took out a tiny communion kit that his church had given him, a small silver chalice of wine in a vial, and he poured that wine in, and he saw it there on the moon. The first liquid that was ever poured out was communion wine. And then he took out the bread, and in that real blackout, He read these verses of being the vine and the branches of abiding in Christ. And there they took communion, knowing that the first meal ever eaten on the moon was the Lord's Supper. I think that's amazing. That amidst that historic occasion, amidst all of the preparation, Amidst all of the world watching, that Buzz Aldrin knew there was a higher purpose. That he took a moment amidst what could have been personal glory to recenter his life and to glorify God. That is purity. 
knowing a purpose beyond anything else. That purpose of being God's holy people. As we come to our time of commitment and we sing this hymn, it is a hymn of commitment, a time for us to think about our own lives, perhaps to make a decision this morning that you would like to share with this, your church, to give your life to Christ. Or maybe this morning as you sing, you simply think through your own life and you think about the call of Scripture, the call of Christ to purity. Whatever is pure, we're here to think on these things, for they make us pure. Would you commit your life again to Christ as we sing our hymn of commitment? you pray with me? We live in a corrupted world, but purity is possible in our Lord Jesus Christ. Give your life to him. Be cleansed. Go and live for him. In Christ's name we go. Amen.